Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is again Sean Ray, and I'm here today with Mr. Anthony Morrison. If you guys have watched any of my videos, you've probably seen him in past videos where we've gone through all of his different properties that he has and breakdowns, and numbers, and follow ups. And so, for all you newbies, Thank you so much for stopping by. Make sure to like, subscribe, and share. In today's video, we're gonna be going over his newest property, and we're gonna be talking about just basically just the numbers. So I'm gonna be putting a couple of pictures on the screen so you have a general idea what we're talking about. But the next video, after this video, we're gonna walk through the property, and he's going to basically just do the Vanna White, show you around, and be like, this is what this inspiration buys, and this is the backyard. So if you guys wanna see that, make sure to stay tuned for the next video we'll be doing probably next week. But without further ado, Mr. Anthony Morris. And say hello to all our beautiful fans. Hey everyone, hope yeah. y'all are doing great today. <laughs> okay, cool. So I have a lot of people asking about you specifically. You and Ray definitely are always the people to talk about a lot. And then some of my investors actually started investing in an area and want to get homes specifically because they saw his property. And so almost all my current investors that are buying Airbnb properties, like, how do I get a house like Anthony? Even Ray was disappointed in his current house that's making a killer amount of money. Um, because he wasn't able to get the badass backyard that he's got. So let's go over the numbers and see if this kind of return ratio, any amount of money that you put into it, could be good for you. Okay, so what is the idea behind this property? You already bought your old property. It was old, it's dilapidated for those of you guys who don't know. Um, you put it like 100,000 plus into the property to get it uh, from basically falling over to making it look nice and you average like around eight to $9,000 a month on that one and then you bought this new one. Why did you decide to go with a new property in this area of town and uh, made it look the way it looks versus forcing a deal like you did before and turn like basically a shack into a golden palace? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, first off, I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna say uh, I appreciate um, everybody that uh, Sean's talked about that's asked about my property. Uh, I'm very humbled, so uh, thank you for thinking my house is great and uh, liking what I have there. Um, going back to my duplex, um, it's not dilapidated <laughs> anymore, <laughs> but uh, it was uh, a big hassle getting everything renovated and um, kind of up to par to where people would want to rent it out. Um, so I wanted to go into West Dallas because it was kind of nearby, um, really close to downtown, uh, and there's a lot of room for improvement and a lot of potential appreciation in that neighborhood. Um, so I was starting to look in that area in the neighborhoods and um, for those of you not in Dallas or not familiar with the West Dallas area, um, there's a, maybe about a quarter to a third of the houses are brand new builds, um, essentially because the old houses are really small and it isn't worth it to renovate them and flip them like a lot of other uh, properties, especially like Bishop Arps. Bishop Arts where my duplex is. So uh, there's more new builds there. If you're looking to buy there, then it's most likely going to be uh, a new build um, that would make it worthwhile for you. So um, I actually was ready to buy another property um, February, January, February of 2020, right before uh, all the COVID stuff happened. And so uh, I was looking around with Sean, looking for houses. I made an offer on two different houses um, that weren't accepted, unfortunately, but um, my mindset is everything happens for a reason. Uh, so maybe it wasn't meant to be for me to get those houses. And it just so happened the those two houses were with the same real estate agent, uh, seller's agent, and they let us know that there was a couple houses that they had that weren't listed yet, one of which was this house. So we went and checked, it out, checked them out. I like this one the best. And so we kind of picked this one and kind of went from there. I want to know why did you decide to go the new build route versus the old like was there any kind of headaches or after you realized the cost benefit analysis of like I've put this much money into this house and I put this much time this much effort and I have all this bullshit BS if I spend an extra twenty or thirty thousand dollars or forty thousand dollars I can get a new home I could potentially make more and I don't have to have so many headaches is that what your mind was at or did you have a different reason for it? One thing that I like to uh, live by is kind of trying everything once and so I at first I wanted to go get into real estate investing um, and I found the duplex and I was able to house hack it and live in there for a year um, after I renovated it. So I wanted to learn that process and went through that, which I was very fortunate to do it and it worked out for me. Um, 
It's a lot, a lot of chances that I had to take on that one um, that ended up working out. Um, so I wanted to go the route and try buying a house that was a new build that didn't need any renovations to fix anything. Everything was perfect from the start. Um, so that's kind of why I went here and in West Dallas, you can find a lot of new builds. So found one that I really liked and, and went there. So this house, our goal in this area was to get homes under for whenever we were purchasing with you, it's under like 180 to 190 per square foot. Now we're just lucky to get it under like 200, 210. So how much did you buy this property for? And do you remember what the price per square footage was? I ended up buying the house um, at closing. It was 380,000 with uh, 10,000 seller concessions. So essentially um, it was 370,000 purchase price. Um, and the square footage is 2420 square feet. If you carry the two, that comes out to $152.89 per square foot. You just did that in your head? Yeah. No I'm way. I'm Asian, so it comes naturally. <laughs> so uh, I, I need to work on saying so. Whenever I make these videos, I'm like, so, so, um, so. Okay, yeah. sorry for those of you who watch my videos and you notice all the so's. One video I even put the different ways to spell so. Uh, I watched that video. Yeah, he comments. Uh, he's one of my Patreon subscribers. He's the most, he's like a brown belt, I think. Or an orange belt, green belt, something. Anyways, I digress. Uh, the, the property in this area that he got for that price is incredible at this point. It's almost insane to think about getting a property that is not list price because it's so competitive, let alone getting a $10,000 concession, which basically means that when you buy the home at closing, the seller gives you $10,000 so you can do whatever you want with. And so that helps you out with closing costs and stuff like that. And then on top of that, you get $152, $153 per square foot. That's insane. Right now in this market, we're super lucky to get like $200. Ray just got 200 or 190, I believe, $200 on his last one. But that was just like pulling teeth. So right now it's like 210 to 230. And this is within like a year, like mm -hmm. not, not even. So there, there was a lot of risk there at the time because it was at the beginning of when all the COVID-19 stuff was happening. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah, you can say that. Okay. <laughs> plus, my channel's not monetized. Okay. Yeah. Well, then we're <laughs> yeah, then we're good. Uh, so it was when all the COVID nineteen stuff was coming about, and there were talks about having to shut shut everything down. Um, and in my head, you know, I was kind of doing the risk reward analysis, and I still decided to push forward because even if things shut down, then you know, I had contingency plans to deal with it. So I think that was part of the reason why I was able to get the price that I did. Um, and it was a hassle because I was under contract for six months um, because the seller partially, we think he was wanting to get more. So he was trying to push me out to break the contract, but I'm kind of stubborn. So I wasn't breaking the contract because I knew I had a good deal. Talk about some of those things like uh, the leaks and like what he did and try to push around in the fence. But first, I want you to talk about what are those contingencies were because I think a lot of people that are watching this were so scared to buy during COVID. And then they're like, you know, that's gonna be a waste of money. No one's gonna rent and Airbnb is falling apart for that time. So what were, you, what were your concerns buying during COVID? And then what were your contingencies with, I think I know what you're gonna say, but you have to also keep in mind, this guy used to watch the, I think he still does, watches one of my, meet Kevin, that's right. I hate that guy, but he has good content, but God, he's punchable. But uh, but he would watch him like every day. So all the updates on the forbearance stuff and the stimulus bills, like he would send me messages every day about it. And so not every day, but. Um, and so was that part of your contingency, just watching so much updates from Meet Kevin, or how did you come up with this contingency plan? That was part of it, um, but it, in reality, uh, my thought process was, you know, no, nobody ever knows if the real estate market's gonna go up or go down. Um, I was looking at numbers from previous years, like the 2008 market crash, um, and how much the real estate market fell um, in Dallas compared to the rest of the nation. And so I kind of took that into account. And then the main idea was essentially, even if prices do fall, I'm not trying to refinance or sell the house within a year or two. I'm holding it for a long term. So by then, the house value would at least be equal, theoretically, hopefully, um, or risen since then. And also, I would be cash flowing while I'm owning the house. And so it's 
Uh, a phrase that I was kind of thinking in my head is more for the real estate market or for the stock market, but it's, it's not timing the market, it's time in the market. So you could try to wait to buy the house like Sean has a previous video um, that we can link somewhere mm -hmm. uh, about get in the market now because you can cash flow uh, and you might make a little bit less than the house appreciates for or the equity that you gain by waiting or you might make a lot more depends on you know the choices you make so you're starting to sound like chicken singapore <laughs> don't be a donkey don't be a donkey <laughs> and don't be a <laughs> yeah. What were the things that kind of prolonged? Because normally you want to close within a month or two. So why did it take so long? And it worked out, by the way. If he would have got it when we initially planned for it, he'd be smack dab in the middle of COVID because it kept on getting pushed out and pushed out. By the time he ended up closing on it, he was able to get the killer deal that he was supposed to get in the beginning because of the downfall of the world. <laughs> and then by the time that things were starting to recover, he was able to still keep that price, but avoid a lot of the mess. And after his two months, which you can explain to you in a second, after his two months of not having to pay mortgage, I mean, he really just skid through that entire thing. So can you tell us kind of what those hiccups were, why it took so long and how you avoided some of the pain? Yeah, so like I referenced before, I, I believe everything happens for a reason, whether you know you think it's the God that you believe in or karma or anything. But um, it was at the beginning of COVID, so part of the contract, there was an, a part to it where uh, there might be delays because the builder wasn't sure if they would have to stop working on the house because of COVID and shutdowns or the supply issues uh, for the materials. So we had that in the contract and it, it ended up after a month after we went on a contract, they had to delay building the house. Um, so that pushed it by at least another month or two. Um, and then from there, there was different issues with this thing wasn't right, that wasn't right. Uh, it rained really hard, so I went in and there were leaks on the floor. So they had to find out the issue. They said the issue was fixed. You know, the week went by, there's no more rain. The leak was still there or a different leak, whatever. But th different issues kept coming up. And so um, I think there were enough leaks that they actually went in and kind of redid a lot of the, the seals and the windows and things. So that was another like two week delay. And then by that point, I canceled my uh, rate lock for uh, through my lender. And so I had to wait another 30 days to lock in a new rate. And so I had to work with them and they, they agreed to do it because of all the hassle and, and things like that. So it worked out. And you used Derek, right? I sure did. Derek Altunian, guaranteed rate. That's right. Ding. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people, whenever they come to me and ask about your property, they say a lot like, what is the, the main thing that separates your property from other people's properties? So I think that mainly what it was when I first started Airbnb, it was me buying like thrift store furniture and Ikea and like my family's hand-me-downs and my family friends hand-me-downs. Like, hey, these sheets don't match, but whatever, who cares, it's Airbnb, right? And so I think that that mentality is what held me back in the beginning. Whereas he really went above and beyond and spent the money on the furniture and spent the money on the decoration and really like made his backyard look beautiful. So for you to do your side projects, like that really cool design that you have on the wall, all your furniture that your girlfriend helped you make or help you pick out and then the backyard and choosing Marcus, right? Use Marcus for the backyard. No, no. Oh. Francisco. Francisco's back here? Okay. Mm -hmm. So with Francisco's bid and everything like that, and without being cedar, what did you ultimately end up having to spend for your furniture and your backyard and decorations? And how long did that take? Great question. Um, when I toured the house uh, and walked in, um, you could tell just from walking into the living room and the kitchen that it's really open. It's a big open concept house and it looks, uh, it looks and feels a lot bigger than it is inside so i think that's also part of what everybody loves about it uh, i saw the big backyard um, and then upstairs there's a patio that you can see the downtown skyline which was another bonus point to it uh, so with those three main things are, are the biggest reasons why i bought the house and the location to downtown uh, but for furnishing the property um, with my duplex i was trying to conserve as much cash as possible and spend as little as I could. So I furnished it very, very cheaply, really, really big value on everything. Um, it kind of turned out to where nothing really matched because I was just 
buying the cheapest thing uh, that I could find that was okay quality. Uh, and it, if you guys want to figure out what he's talking about, if you haven't seen it, at the end of this video, I'll make sure to link his video that he actually went through how he spent for his upstairs and downstairs for his duplex, like $6,000 or something crazy like that. And that was to furnish out like five or six bedrooms. How many bedrooms is it? It's five bedrooms. So five bedrooms. So five bedrooms and two living rooms, kit two kitchens, and you get all that for six thousand each floor. So twelve thousand total. Oh, six thousand each floor. Yeah. yeah. I'll, With that property, I was focused mainly on the lowest cost and best value. Uh, nothing really matched, and that kind of tied everything together because nothing matched. So everything went together. But with this property, um, I wanted to go with good quality things that looked great and since it was a new build you don't you don't want to have cheap stuff in there because then it just kind of destroys the whole new look and feel but on that note i am also half asian so i'm going to be frugal no matter what i'm offended by that it's all right okay. you can still be frugal too uh i identify as an asian perfect <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're such good friends yeah. so with the furnishing of uh this new house um, I actually, part of it was, uh, because we were in the middle of COVID and everything, I was still trying to conserve as much cash as possible. So I went to Nebraska Furniture Mart and I opened a Nebraska Furniture Mart credit card, uh, and bought what I could there with a two year, no interest payments. And that turned out to be, I think 6,000 I spent there with like $200 a month payments. And so essentially no money out of my pocket. Um, and then after that, I spent about just under 19,000 to furnish all four bedrooms and the, you know, the dining table and the couches and, and everything inside. And then um, as Sean just referenced, I went to one of the contractors that we work with, uh, Francisco, and got a bid for the backyard with uh, different ideas that I, I had that uh, my beautiful girlfriend, Nikki, helped me come up with. Uh, so thank you for that. And got a bid and I spent about 16 and a half, 16,500 um, right around there for the backyard. And he quoted about two weeks to get it done. So I closed on the house August 3rd um, and it took me all of August pretty much to furnish the house fully. And I had my first booking the first weekend of September, so Labor Day weekend. Uh, so I had to get everything done by then. Overall, how much uh, if you combine those two together, Mr. Math? That would be $41,500. Oh my God. <laughs> so just over 41000 pretty much. Yeah, cool. All right, so if you have 41000 you're looking forward to getting a new build in Dallas. 41,000 will get you in there, have a badass backyard, great furnishing, and it takes less than a, about three weeks to make that all happen, depending on the time. Now again, right now, this is a different market. Like t since then, wood prices have gone dramatically up. So prices on homes have gone up, and then prices for pergolas and all the stuff like that has gone up. I tried, I just built a wood box from the backyard. It was $200 to build a wood box, a cedar wood box. I bought the materials from Home Depot. I can build you a wood box for $195. It took you three weeks to make it happen. What, uh, what was your strategy on marketing the property? Did you take, uh, cause some people, including myself, they take pictures of the entire place being empty and like coming soon, new beautiful home on Airbnb starting October or whatever. Did you photo did you do photos of the inside empty or did you wait until you had it nice looking and then you took photos and then you put it on Airbnb? Everything I do is a special circumstance. Uh, I like to say that I'm the exception to every rule. Uh, it kind of turns out that way. Uh, I didn't choose this life, it chose me. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> my first guest was actually an inquiry from my previous house, the duplex. Um, she was trying to find somewhere for Labor Day weekend. Uh, she wanted to book my duplex, uh, but I told her like, hey, I'm going to have this new house up and running, uh, hopefully by your reservation date. It's a brand new house. I'll give it to you for the same price because I'm trying to ramp it up by then. Uh, so she agreed. Um, and you know, I kind of hadn't talked to her for a while because of all the COVID stuff and everything. But uh, right before I closed, I kind of reached out to her, make sure she was still interested. And then halfway through, when I knew that I would be on on time to finish everything by her reservation, um, I actually created a listing um, just so that she could book that weekend. 
uh, just to make sure she had it squared away. And then when I created the listing, I used the the main pictures that I liked from the MLS listing. So the front house, uh, the backyard, I just had just, um, the random bare backyard, but I kind of drew in like <laughs> my ideas. <laughs> so it kind of worked out at, at first. Uh, and then like the kitchen, showing the kitchen, the living room, and then the upstairs patio. So the like four or five main pictures that I thought would sell the house to people. Um, I didn't send any, I didn't put any pictures of like the bare bedrooms or anything, but uh, just a base listing to get it listed, get it up there and active, had the first booking. And then when I put more stuff in, like when I put the beds in, I put a picture of those and put it up. And then every, as I kind of ramped up, uh, updated the listing. And then as soon as I was finished, I had a professional photographer come. We did a dusk sunset uh, shoot. Uh, and so we had the fire pit going and everything and the tiki torches out in the backyard and all the string lights uh, downstairs and on the upstairs patio uh, lit up and so it, it just turned out amazing. You don't necessarily, a lot of people think that you need to wait until you have all your pictures perfect and then post it. But what you're doing if you do that is that you waste a month of potential bookings. Because surprisingly, I know it sounds crazy, but surprisingly people don't care as much as you think they do about the properties, perfect, all the interiors and pictures. They want to know how many beds it is. If it has nine beds, they're like, okay, well, damn, this has nine beds. All the other homes in the area have four or five. Uh, because just because you have four or five bedrooms does not mean you have four or five beds. You can fit, especially this guy and Ray, they fit three beds in one king size room all the time. I'm like, dude, you guys are crazy. Uh, so yeah, you don't have to wait. You, so you can pre-plan and pre-market and by the time that you get your house ready, you already have bookings. Speaking of bookings, what did you have your rate at when you first got started? And then have you increased your rate now that the COVID uh, situation is no longer as a threat? It still is not perfect, but we've seen that it's in Dallas. All, all my listings for my for my investors were pretty much all booked up now, which that wasn't the case like a month ago. Yeah, so great question. I had to, you you want to ramp up um, your, your pricing uh, from the first month um, pro probably every week or two you want to you know bump it up but what Sean was referencing before I was actually on the opposite side of the way that I started this property because I wanted to wait till everything was perfect I took great pictures and then it was up but by then I realized like you're already missing out on time for people to book they'll pay a better price just to make sure that they have a place reserved especially if you're doing large groups so that's why I went this route on this house because I, I saw the value in it because you can't get a booking if it's not there to be booked. So pe people would want to, they would rather find a place and book it. Um, and then if it doesn't turn out to be the right place, they'll cancel it or file a complaint or something with Airbnb and then get their money back and then they can book an actual place. But uh, that actually gives you the chance to get the place booked and start making money from the start and get the ball rolling. Uh, but with that ball rolling, you want to ramp it up from the start because you don't have many reviews. People don't really trust it yet, um, especially people that want to pay the big money. So they'll wait until they get the good pictures and get the reviews. So you start with the smaller ones. Um, I don't remember exactly what price I had it at when I first started, but I think it was 300, 400 a night on yeah, the weekends. It was 399 on the weekends. Yeah, 399 on the weekends and then like $200 on the weekdays or weeknight, weekday nights. So I, I ramped it up uh, throughout September and then pretty much by October, I had it to 600 a night on the week nights, weekend nights. And then now it's, it's about 700 a night. And I actually just talked to my property manager, Josh. Thank you, Josh, um, to raise the prices because it's been doing so well and it's already booked out pretty, pretty heavily uh, in the next few months that I, I think it's time to bump up the pricing. Now keep in mind, this is crazy to think that this area that West Dallas is in, I mean, you'll see homeless people walking up and down the streets, you'll see people in the corner trying to sell you crack, uh, random crack cats running around, houses that are, you know, really busted up and then chain link fences and 10 cars on one property. So that's like, that's what the neighborhood looks like and then you have like these nice small pockets. If you're doing $700, $750 a night in uh, your fee, then that doesn't include like all the other Airbnb fees and taxes and everything like that. So these people are potentially paying over a thousand dollars a night 
to book his house. If you think about it, that's wild. In an yeah. area of town that's not, like, most people wouldn't want to live in this area of town, but they're paying a $1,000 a night to visit this area of town. To me, that just blows my mind. So don't necessarily pigeonhole yourself into certain areas because you think that in Dallas, people want to stay in Highland Park. In Dallas, people want to stay in Lakewood. That's true, people in Dallas do want to do that, but you're having to spend a million or $2 million for those houses, and you're not going to be making that much more than $1,000 a night. And he's spending on his property under 400000 which you can't do anymore, but hopefully in the future you can. Uh, but you're spending $400,000 to get the same amount, and people are still happy with it. I mean, what's your current rating right now? Um, I think I'm at like a 4.86 rating out of five. Hey, makes sense, it makes money, right? So that makes sense to me. If you can get less, just under five stars and make that return with that amount of investment, that's just uh, all day, uh, uh, all day, but not currently all day because we don't have it. There's been like three months without us finding one good deal. Okay, so for the final hurrah, the most important thing that everybody probably wants to stay. If you guys stuck around this long, hey, high five to you two. All right, there might be two of you viewing right now. <laughs> Just two of us talking to two of you. But thanks, Mom. And, uh, <laughs> and Sean. And Sean Rakajit, yeah. And probably you later. Uh, but how much do you make on this property for the first, uh, I think, three or four months in 2020? And then how much you made in 2021? <laughs> So great question. Uh, I had it active starting uh, Labor Day weekend, so first weekend in September. So I was ramping it up in September. I think I made about four thousand total. So on on this property, so that basically covered my mortgage and everything uh, and the start costs, uh, except for furnishing it. But since then, uh, it has been it kind of ramped up quickly. And so October, November, and December. I basically averaged for this house, I averaged about ten or eleven thousand dollars a month in COVID. Yeah, yeah, it's still still COVID pre vaccine, so there weren't too many travelers coming. But I feel like with the setup for the backyard, that's a big thing. Some people have commented specifically about the fire pit, other people, uh, there's been a lot of like wedding related events that uh, people book it for uh, because of the layout of the backyard. So I think it turned out really, really great. And that's what has spurred everybody to come uh, to my house. And that's probably what sets me apart from the, uh, the other houses is the backyard mainly. Um, but for those three months, I was averaging for this house uh, about 10 or 11,000. So including my duplex, uh, I'm averaging or I averaged about 18,000 a month total in revenue. And then with 2021 in January and February, uh, January I kept the average of 18,000 February had quite a dip uh, I'm not really sure uh, what was the cause of that I got to look into that but for March I'm already at uh, over 19,000 so well, February was a freeze that might be part of it uh, the I freeze think. busted me up like, uh, my, my properties were empty for like a week and a half because the in Dallas we had a freeze I don't know if you guys heard about it but it was the end times. Hell froze over for real. Exactly. Yeah, that actually hurt my duplex because uh, I had six burst pipes. And so I had some guests that stayed and they were not happy and they left. New guests came. They still came to Dallas even during the storm and they ended up staying and then there was no electricity or running water. Uh, and so they left, obviously. But yeah, that freeze was no joke. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so you're averaging about 18, you say, like this month? March, I'm already at over 19,000, but... for No, for one property or for both properties? For both. both okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, how is this possible? <laughs> okay, so you probably are making around 11 on... You're not sure? It's probably about 12 for this property, 12,000 in March for the new house, and then still the so 7,000 for the old place and just so you guys know it is currently March 12th it takes me like three weeks to edit a video <laughs> and so when this comes out it'll probably be June but uh, but no I uh, just so you guys know it's it, he's already done like 11 or 12 thousand in March and it's only March 12th and so that's pretty cool and as of last week I actually hit over a hundred thousand in revenue for 2021 yay so in 2021, it's only March, and he's already made $100,000 between his two properties in potential earnings for the year. 
Future so, bookings, yeah. Yeah, future bookings, like people booking in June and then May, April. But that's awesome, man. Thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. That's super cool. So the goal is to hit 150 throughout the year. Yeah, so, that's, that's amazing. So Unless you're the IRS, then I'm not making anything. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops. I have to reinvest it all into my, <laughs> my house. Yeah, yeah. it's expenses. <laughs> exactly. So last question. What is your goal? You're how old right now? I'm 33. 33. And a half. And you want how many more properties before you start reassessing and start thinking about retirement? Probably another two properties. Two properties. And you're going to buy another property this year, correct? That's my plan. Okay. So by fall, you're going to buy your third property and then you're going to buy one more after that next year. And then what? What are you going to do? Uh, probably by then, the goal is to retire and not work a 9 to 5 W2 job anymore. Um, even though I love it, if any coworkers are watching, it's mm -hmm. great, best job in the world. But it's not what I want to do long term. So um, I do have a goal in the future to travel a lot and see the world and you know experience the world, um, whether it be post COVID. You know, I don't know how different it will be from pre-COVID because I didn't see most of the world pre-COVID. So for me, it'll just be new experiences. Well, cool, man. Uh, that's a great that's a great plan. If you keep up at this rate, then after two more homes, you're going to be able to slam in $200,000 a year potentially or more in revenue for Airbnb. That's fantastic. If your overhead is $70,000 a year, then it's still $130,000 in profit. So you're making more than some doctors and nurses, I guess doctors, some doctors and and um, and professional people that take eight years of school and a bunch of a bunch of debt just to have the same thing that you can do residually while traveling the world. It sounds pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So as they say, residual income creates happiness. Well, that's pretty much it. That's most of the questions that we have. I know that you guys are going to be asking questions in the comments. And so he is very active in the comments as well. He likes to uh, comment on most of my videos. My comment muscle, right? <laughs> right here. So if you guys have any more questions, make sure to comment below. He'll answer them most likely, at least for the first 24 to 48 hours this video is up. And thank you very much, Mr. Anthony, for stopping by. Of course, man. Make sure to like, subscribe, and see you on the flip side. And also see us in uh, Lords of Travel. We have a Lords of Travel channel. We're going to be posting that stuff in probably five years from now. So everybody wants to know. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so, 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 uh, so, uh, I'm gonna probably name my kids. So, uh, so, uh, yeah. Hey, so, uh, <laughs> hey, so, uh, <laughs> can you do this? So, uh, so, uh, can you do this? Yeah. So, great question. Um, <laughs> I like that you say that. It's like I know, right? It is a good question. Uh, so, <laughs> so, uh, so, uh. <laughs>